Well, thank you, everyone, for this chance to come and talk to you. Really appreciate it. And as I said, we do appreciate um, not having to drive over to your place in the weather. I'm the driver in our household. I noticed that, that somebody called Barry was on screen, and I think many years ago, I think it's the same Barry, we went to do a talk to his plant society group, and it was the heaviest deluge I have ever driven in coming home. So I'm doubly grateful for not driving to Hornsby tonight. So let's get underway with the slideshow. Um, as I think a number of you will be aware, North Head had a rather unfortunate fire on the 17th of October a year and a half ago. It started out to be a very responsible hazard reduction burn, but it escaped. And we'll just do a brief overview of the background to that, and we'll, then we'll spend most of the presentation talking about what's happened to bushland since then, or the bushland and the wildlife. And once again, because I'm using the screen, I've got a what? Page, page down. Okay, well, I was trying to find your page down. Okay, <laughs> now I'll get used to his keyboard. So, just to set a little bit of context, <clears throat> North Head is predominantly coastal heathland of one sort or another. But as this now um, fairly old map done by Nick Skelton when the Hub Trust first took over the North Head defence lands shows we've got a fairly rich diversity of different vegetation types. And the two with the red arrows to them are what we're particularly interested in. So we've got eastern suburbs, Banksia scrub, an open coastal heathland with a particular mix of species that is now a critically endangered um, ecological community nationally, shown in the darker of those two greens. And in the slightly olivey green up through the centre of the headland, <coughs> we've got some what generally gets described as senescent scrub. It's eastern suburb Fancier scrub, but it's been long undisturbed and it is heavily dominated by mostly old and not very vibrant tea tree. Those um, particular communities, as you can see on the map, make up the majority of the headland with some other coastal heaths and a few other species, um, plant ecological communities around the perimeters. It's incredibly rich and diverse botanically for the area that it is. It's, the whole headland is just under 300 hectares, as you can see on the table on the right. Um, and we, uh, we will point out that two far right columns are, as Geoffrey said, extremely scrubby, rubbery. I would have said um, perhaps not very reliable estimates. But the North Head, the headland as a whole, is both species and genera rich, um, probably richer than most other ecological communities except as found in okay. botanical gardens, at, at, at per, for, given its area, given its 300 hectare area. So having set that scene, what happened when we had that, this fire? Okay, right there. Near the um, sewage treatment plant out on the northern corner of North Head, the headland, we have Sydney Waters, we don't call it a sewage works anymore as it's called on that map. We now have to call it a wastewater treatment plan. And adjoining that site was a, a patch of um, Banksia scrub, which was quite long unburned. And the idea was to do an 8.7 hectare burn, a well-controlled hazard reduction burn, which would help to revitalise that part of the headland. And I do have to say that over the nearly 20 years that Jeff and I have been involved in North Head, the fire services have been increasingly cooperative about doing hazard reduction burns that will assist the ecology as well as helping the, um, reducing the risk of fire. We set out, they set out to do the 8.7 hectare burn that's in the top right-hand corner of the um, right-hand side of your screen. It was extremely well planned, as I'll show in a minute, but for various reasons, which we'll just briefly outline, 
it escaped over a control line and rather than burning 8.7 hectares, it burnt about 60 hectares and then there was a backburn to control and prevent wiping out the North Fort heritage area, which took out another chunk shown on the bottom right of your screen. Um, it spread fairly rapidly. The initial spread after the escape wasn't too bad, but from there on, it took off. The planning was all done as part of a carefully planned 10-year pattern of mosaic burns. The idea being that different patches of the headland would be burnt at intervals to minimise the risk of wildfire, to protect the heritage assets, and at the same time, to help maintain the diversity in eastern suburbs thanks to scrub. And the two panels on this slide show you some fairly vigorous, um, relatively recently disturbed eastern suburbs thanks to scrub. And by relatively recently, I mean generally within the last eight to 10 years. And then the one on the right is an area of eastern suburbs thanks to scrub, known as the senescent PSBS, that was long unburnt, probably as best we can tell from fire records, 20 to 30 years since it was burned. Heavily dominated by old, dry, and not very interesting in our view, tea tree, and with nothing like the diversity that we get on the left. <clears throat> so what was done to prepare for this hazard reduction burn? The fire agencies, and here we're talking about Fire and Rescue New South Wales, working with the National Parks and Wildlife Service and the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, who are the two major landholders on North Head, doing a comprehensive and very cooperative plan for the 8.7 hectare burn. Next, as I mentioned, to the Sydney Water Treatment Plant. They spent quite a bit of time clearing and we put control lines in quotes because, as we'll see, they didn't really work as control lines um, along the stone wall primarily to help um, ensure a perimeter for control of the fire, but also to protect heritage stone wall walls, which are badly affected by hot fire. All of the services recognise that burns on North Head are tricky to do because of the terrain, the vegetation, the fact that it's almost an island with steep cliffs around most of it. You get localised wind eddies and it's a popular tourist and walker destination and cyclist destination as well. So the control lines were put in place. There were, it was careful checking of the weather forecast. There's been some accusations around that the fire services were a bit negligent in that regard. Well, I sit as Nature Conservation Council's rep on two bushfire committees, including the one that's responsible for North Head. And I know from the um, records, from the debrief and for the incident controller on the day, that he took the extra caution of getting a final report from the Bureau of Met at about 9.30 on the night before the burn. They had already done a team walk around with the three agencies involved the day before to make sure everything was in place, everything was laid out, everything should have been right to go first thing on a Saturday morning, the 17th of October. All the neighbouring um, properties had been all, uh, notified, as had North Head residents, and with businesses. So there are both voluntary organisations and commercial businesses on North Head had all been alerted to the fact that the burn was being done, with the planned timing and the area. There were several um, what they refer to in the fire services as boy walls and big inflatable tanks with rolled out hose lines ready for action put in place beforehand. There were 40 fire trucks of variable size from your little utility with a tanker on the back up to the big, um, biggest category fire trucks on site before they lit up and the appropriate personnel, which adds up to about 100 fire agency people from the three agencies involved. And they don't ever do a burn these days at North Head without having one helicopter on standby. They had two for this particular day. So I feel as though... Um, pretty much all the precautions that could have been were taken. There's a couple of pictures of the preparation. The one at the top is the main control line along the stone wall. To our left is the area that was being subjected to the plan burn. 
over the fence is a long, unburnt and quite senescent um, eastern suburbs fancy a scrub with a lot of old, dry tea tree. So, of course, nobody wanted it over the wall. Um, the bottom photo is the final walk around of the various agencies that were involved, checking the hoses that were rolled out, making sure that all the tracks were accessible, making sure that the um, barricades were in place and, and just generally checking that everything was good to go on Saturday morning. So what went wrong? Well, I don't think in almost 20 years of working with fire ecologists that I have heard so much community contention around a, a burn, intentional or otherwise, except perhaps the 2019-20 fire season, um, to what there was in this. There was outright community hostility. There was some very ill-informed information being circulated. And the fire agencies that were involved jointly did a very detailed debrief afterwards. They identified as some of the missteps, if we can call them that, were that a number of, being a Saturday morning, a number of walkers had chosen to walk their way past the barricades that clearly us to keep out has a production burn plan and the areas taped off with um, stripy tape. The fire services probably responsibly decided they had to clear the area of walkers before they lit up. So the burn wasn't lit up at, at between eight and nine as they'd anticipated. It was lit up much later. It was a warmer day by then and the bushland was much drier. Probably the biggest downfall was that watching the fire patterns and the way it burnt, clearly there were localised wind eddies that were just pretty much unpredicted, even though we know that the fire on the headland, the wind on the headlands, um, always somewhat unpredictable. It was almost certainly created based on some modelling sense on the terrain in that particular burn site and the fact that as has become much more um, recognised since this burn, if you've got old, dry coastal heath, you don't have three separate layers of fire fuel like you do in most other plant communities, the grassy area, the intermediate shrub layer and the tree layer, but you have an almost continuous layer of fuel and that clearly was a factor here. The, the um, Sydney Hub Federation Trust, who are responsible for most of the water supply that was used, have um, not been entirely willing to confirm that the water supply is inadequate, but we know every time we have a hazard reduction burn up there, when there's heavy demand on the water, the old water supply lines are just not up to it. And there were hoses that just shut down at critical times. And, of course, as I said, once it bounced over that wall, it was into long, unburned, senescent tea tree with an enormous fuel load. The result was that Eddie carried it across the stone wall that I showed a couple of slides back, across that control line. The incident controller on the day told us in a debrief at a bushfire committee meeting shortly afterwards that he had personally seen either five or six spot fires go over the wall at the same time into dry fuel and off it went. The result, as we've said, was a fairly hot burn across 67 hectares instead of 8.7. Lots of bushland habitat loss, some wildlife losses. Australian Wildlife Conservancy, who are the main science research agency up there, lost quite a lot of field equipment, cameras and related equipment, logging, data logging machines and things. And there was extensive damage, as you'll see in some of the later slides, to the walking tracks. But fortunately, there were no heritage buildings lost, thanks largely to the efforts of the various fire agencies, and no loss of or injury to firefighters or others. So enough about the fire, and we're happy to answer other questions later if, if you want to. Um, but we're here to talk about what's happened since. And... I can only say I can't speak highly enough of what the small team in the Australian Wildlife Conservancy Sydney team did in the first two weeks post-fire. They had the vet, the, um, vet hospital at the zoo on tap within a day or two. They worked closely together to rescue injured animals. 
some had to be euthanized, but many of them were taken to the zoo and later rehabilitated. They installed some refuge tunnels to protect small animals because all of the canopy, of course, was gone, which made them vulnerable to predators. Um, they installed food and drink stations for the animals. They set up quite a lot of monitoring cameras across the burnt area, mainly to watch out for predators because we know that both um, foxes and some of the predatory birds um, will come in very quickly after a fire. And there was a lot of um, recording of that in the 2019-20 big bushfires. And they also began very quickly afterwards, five or six quite detailed bushfire recovery research projects in coastal heathland, none of which had been done before, all of which will produce valuable information for other sorts of coastal heath, everything ranging from an honours thesis through to two or three PhD theses that are still in progress. And at the same time, National Parks and Wildlife Service and the Harbour Trust were pretty quick in getting in exclusion fences, initially to make safe, um, to protect the burnt areas from um, people trampling or otherwise going in there, to protect people from going into what still might be smouldering, and to provide some bandicoot bungalows, which I'll show you in a coming slide. So within that first two weeks after the fire and in places where there was still smouldering um, happening, we had these amazing wildlife tunnels, um, metal hoops, half hoops, with a fine mesh covering to provide habitat for all of the animals that were now heavily exposed. In the vicinity of those tunnels, they provided the water points that you can see on the right. And the bandicoot bungalows that I referred to were made by National Parks and Wildlife Service. They use discarded shipping pallets, cover them with local vegetation, stake them into place, and you've got a place for the bandicoots to retreat to undercover. Then things progressed, appeared to us to progress fairly slowly for a start in terms of recovery. We've got on the left of this slide one of the really good eastern suburbs fancier scrub, vibrant areas that existed before the fire, a walking track up through it, a metal track on solid bearers that I had naively imagined were timber, but in fact were a composite resin. And as the second slide shows you, the second picture shows you, during the fire, they were wonderful fuel. All those burning steps, and not the steps that are burning, but the bearers that they were on top of, up through our, one of our prized bits of eastern suburbs bank to scrub. By the time we got to a year, no, sorry, the next one was the Harbour, Harbour Trust and National Parks were very quick then to install um, barricades to the tracks, which weren't always observed by visitors. Um, and they remained that way for quite a long time. By March last year, six months or so after the fire, some of the repairs were underway, but they then found that there was a shortage of those bearers. They looked at all sorts of other ways of mounting the tracks that might be more resistant, but in the end went back to the same sorts of structures so that by September last year, a full year after the fire, we had that track reopened and it really provided, if you compare the, the, the image on the left and the image on the right, it provided people with a good sense of some of what we lost, but what we hope to get back to over time. We'll then show you a few more slides of things as the recovery slowly progressed. Um, just taken from different locations around the site. The left one, taken from Bluefish Road, is right near where the intentional burn was first lit up. The next one is, you can see on the right of the central picture, the stone wall. That's the stone wall that was the main control line, and it's just downslope from that. Still in the area that was intended to burn, 
But by the time the fire got to this point, it was burning with high intensity and that's where it leapt over the fence. And the third photo is um, taken from the track, not too far from where those damaged steps are, and that was a really good piece of eastern suburbs thanks to the scrub. But don't despair. We'll show you things that are more hopeful. Um, some other sites taken at various times during 2021, so roughly a, a year after the fire. The area that's known as the Hanging Swamp, it's got the right sort of vegetation to be a Hanging Swamp ecological community, but it's actually an artificial construct rather than a natural one, but not, not dissimilar from some sites that occur in the Blue Mountains. That is would normally be a far, an area that you would not put a hazard reduction burn anywhere near, and it wasn't expected to be anywhere near it, and it did take a long time to come back, but it is slowly now coming back. Uh, the one that we've labelled the dune above the memorial walk is clearly, you know, I think you're probably all familiar with the fact that you can see the xanthoreas coming in very quickly after a fire, and they went crazy in this area. The bottom left, we've, we've called it the Godinia Fields. There's an informal track that goes down to a water sump, a more moist area than a lot of our North Head sandy dune area, and it just went crazy with Godinia that we had barely seen in there before the fire. And then many of you will be familiar with the Fairfax Lookout Loop, and this photo is taken looking into the centre of that walking loop near the lookouts right at the top of North Head. Fairly slow to recover and fairly much only ground cover that was coming back within the first year. Now we move on to the current year. So we're now getting up to 18 months post fire. At the Hanging Swamp area, which looked pretty sad after the fire, things are coming back fairly well. You can see various bits of vegetation of different types through there. And that, what we refer to as the eastern suburbs, thanks to scrub dune, looking up from the hand swamp, an area that was fairly rich beforehand, is again coming back with quite a good diversity of the right sorts of species. Some more of the regrowth. Um, and again, we've included those steps so that you can compare where we were pre-fire, very soon after the fire, and just about a month ago. And the diversity in there is now looking good. Yes, we've got all those old, um, mostly uh, lipisperm tea tree stags still standing, and the fire service is concerned that they make for more fuel for another fire. But I think that's still a, a subject of much discussion yet. But quite pleased with the regeneration that's happening. So what do we know about that regeneration process? And some of you, given your interest, may have quite a bit of knowledge in this area. But from work that we've done, I mentioned that the fire services have been very good about working to, they can't do a hazard reduction burn for ecological purposes, but they have been very good about working with National Park Service, the Harbour Trust, and with ourselves and other ecologists to um, plan that mosaic of burns in a way that will ensure that as far as possible, they are done in old senescent areas that need some revitalisation and to plan a mosaic across the headland. So burns that were done in 2012 near the North Fort area and in 2018 in the centre of the headland were ones that we worked with a fire ecologist to look at the pre and post fire <coughs> reactions. And in the photo on the right, you can see why we need to fence out rabbits. Behind that fence, which is a fair, over the first three to five years, with a little bit of maintenance, it's a simple and fairly effective rabbit excluder. And we do have a real problem with rabbits at North Head. Behind the fence, um, I think that photo is probably a three-year post-fire photo. Vigorous regrowth and good diversity of eastern suburbs, banks, scrubs. Outside the fence, 
no other treatment except the fence being put in and we've got very little of anything. That was at a time when post-fire we had had rain, there was good new growth and the rabbits thrived. So I think our first piece of knowledge from our own work is that in this kind of coastal heathland, if we've had a fire as far as possible, we need to keep rabbits out to let the bushland recover. The other thing that we know, and I'm sorry if this is a slightly complicated slide, but I'll try and talk us through it, is that rainfall, not surprisingly, in the early months after fire is important. The 2018 burn, the um, picture labelled Q26217, is pre-fire in an old and fairly senescent bit of eastern suburbs fancy scrub. We had the burn in May 2018. You can see in the red bars the average north head rainfall for each month and in the green bars what was happening in that year with the rainfall. And between 2018 in May when it was burnt and 2019 where it first says survey, we had had a very erratic rainfall season. Two rainfall events of the sort that we've had in the last few weeks and not very many months apart from that we were where we were at or above average. So when we surveyed in 2019, our botanist was somewhat pessimistic about bushland recovery because we weren't seeing a lot of regrowth. What we were seeing were seedlings that weren't prospering very well. But when she came back to do another survey in spring a year later, the picture on the bottom right-hand corner, um, things were looking good. We had vigorous growth, diverse species, and in most cases better in each of our survey plots than what we had had pre-fire, which was what we were hoping to get where the tea tree had started to dominate. So I guess our two messages about the recovery and two things that we were watching closely from the um, unintended fire were what's happening with the rabbits and what's happening with rainfall. Where are we up to now? Well, we haven't had any surveys since the last two weeks and I hope we haven't lost too much topsoil because that can also affect our recovery. But the Wildlife Conservancy's work has already shown through those research projects that it's doing that um, <clears throat> bush rats, long-nosed bandicoots and a number of the other small animals were using the tunnels extensively in the early post-fire period and those species are now, if not back to normal, then certainly close to normal at the most recent surveys. The little brown antichinus, which had been very hard to find, they'd, they'd been thought to be extinct on the headland. They'd been carefully reintroduced by AWC and they were monitoring them regularly and they'd had a lot of trouble detecting them. Sometime post-fire, they discovered them in areas where they hadn't been introduced on North Head, but, but not where they'd been introduced. And they seemed to have found themselves a preferred habitat to the ones that they'd carefully been reintroduced to, and their numbers are now looking quite healthy. Echidnids remained active across North Head, even in the early post-fire period, and we know that they're fairly good at finding themselves shelters during fire, not just from here, but from other places as well. So after some concerns in the early post-fire period, the animals, as far as AWC's regular monitoring shows, are remaining in the burnt areas. The animals have all returned to healthy condition and rabbit and fox control measures are ongoing at North Head as they always are, but perhaps with even more diligence now that we've had so much habitat removed and, and so many um, safe places removed for the small mammals. I guess the other thing I just wanted to talk about briefly, and again, I'm sorry if this is not new news to all of you, um, is that we, we were pretty much overwhelmed with what can we do to help? Shouldn't we be planting things? Can't the North Head Sanctuary Foundation do more about helping the area recover? Well, we talked to a number of fire ecologists. We used our own observations. 
And our conclusions were very much that the best thing we can do is to avoid going back into the area so that we don't have trampling of the emergent plants, we don't create unplanned tracks, which will give habitat fragmentation and expose um, small mammals and things. Again, there has been a little bit of unplanned track, particularly to that Gardenia park that we saw. Um, by not increasing the tracks, we don't contribute to erosion and loss of topsoil. One of my bugbears, having worked nationally on weed spread in the past, is that fire areas or other exposed areas, we're amazed at how much we take weeds in on shoes and clothes, leaving the wildlife undisturbed while it's recovering, and certainly a challenge at North Head is keeping out both dogs and cats. But the two management agencies up there are both pretty conscientious about that. And my answer to most of the people who pestered me about why aren't we doing more was we should be letting nature take its course. If we intervene too soon, we may actually do more harm and not um, let the natural succession of recovery happen. The other question that we've had a lot of discussion about and we've, we've deliberately engaged with various Indigenous fire experts is shouldn't North Head just be exposed to what has become known as cultural burning? Small, um, localised, low-intensity burns of the type that Aboriginal Australians did when they managed the landscape. But we had a wonderful talks and field day organised by Nature Conservation Council last year and we had an Indigenous land management um, speaker who made some very telling points that I thought were very valuable in this discussion. He pointed out that the knowledge of country is gleaned over generations, not, as I think he said, not weeks, not years, not even decades. We haven't had any Aboriginal people living in most of our coastal heathlands in the Sydney region for a very, very long time. So those people don't have the ancestors who lived on country and could pass on the knowledge. He suggested that if we thought about it, there were very few of us who have worked on country for 50 years, let alone for several generations. The fire agencies are increasingly working with particularly the Aboriginal program that calls itself Fire Sticks Alliance. It's an alliance of Aboriginal knowledge holders who are trying to learn from their elders and to share their knowledge about fire management. But again, I've heard some of those folks say, we need to get to know country again before we can practice cultural burning really well. And of course, climate change, as we've seen too well in the last couple of weeks, is changing everything and will certainly change fire management as well. So, yes, we want to introduce cultural burning in places like North Head, but it's not as simple as engaging somebody and going out and doing it. If you enjoyed this video, why not subscribe and view other great content? New videos being added all the time.